It's definitely a privilege to be here this evening. Uh, I don't know how long Sean and I have known each other. The first memory I have is out at Quinlan at our gospel meeting. And uh, I remember his love for sound preaching as well as his uh, beautiful shaven dome. So, uh, <laughs> But it's great to be here. What I'd like for you to do is take your mind back to 1965. A little bit more difficult for me to do because I was born in 1982, but I imagine there were a lot of leisure suits and some some very large hair. But 1965, the Brown Trail School of Preaching came into existence. Two years later, we had our first graduating class that consisted of four men. Dan Carter, Danny Cornish, Bill Reed, and Ron Cole. The reason those names flow so quickly off my tongue is not because we have a class of memorizing former graduates, but because I've been on the phone with three out of the four of them over the past few weeks. The reason I haven't been able to talk to Brother Cole is because he's dead. And they don't have phone calls that go that far. So, uh, but he's gone on to his reward. And to their credit, those men that graduated in 67, one has just retired as of a few months ago, and that was Bill Reed. So the school's definitely done wonders as these guys have gone out for so many years to preach sound doctrine. So we consider the the Brown Trail School of Preaching, there have been quite a few different directors that have been in charge of the school. The first director was Roy Deaver, then Wendell Winkler, Eddie Witten. Maxie Bourne has been the director on two different occasions. Uh, Dave Miller was director for 10 years, and our current director since 2003 has been Robert Stapleton. Uh, Our class consists of a curriculum of 56 courses, 2,400 classroom hours, and then almost as many studying outside of class Basically, our program is four years crammed into two years. Uh, There's a guy that is working on taking classes through WVBS. And I said, how's that going for you? And he said, well, I started Genesis five months ago, and and I'm not through it yet. And I said, well, I said, it would have taken me 50 years to do the intense study and to learn what I learned in that two years at Brown Trail to go out and do it on my own. And I'm a go-getter. It just, it's one of those, it's an intense pressure cooker. As Mike Roberts, the preacher down at Ferris, Texas, called it, he called it the abyss. Is, it's, it's intense. It's the hardest thing that, I ever, that I've ever done. I actually had a master's degree in education before I came into preaching school. That master's degree wasn't worth the paper it's printed on compared to the difficulty of preaching school. It's, gonna, it's intense, but it's a, a great kind of intensity because there's nothing more important to study. One of the beautiful things about being a member of the New Testament church is the fact that I don't have to make anything up. I'm not a clever guy. It's not the truth, I'm very clever. But I'm not a clever guy in the sense of making up my own doctrine. I love being a member of the New Testament church because I open up the pages of the New Testament and people say, how come you don't use instrumental music? All right, well, let's turn here. Let's look. Let's find out why we do what we do, what authority that we have. As I like to say, it's easy, cheesy, lemon squeezy. It's the easiest thing to be a member of the New Testament church. So we consider the different things that go on at the school. The school is housed in the second story of the Brown Trail Church of Christ building at 1801 Brown Trail in Bedford, Texas. We have uh, two different hallways that the school partakes that's in. It's like an L shape. And there's the, the loud hallway and the quiet hallway. And rather ironically, I was in the quiet hallway for a little while. That didn't work out for very long. We ended up all moving offices. But in our loud hallway, we have our two English classrooms, our Spanish classroom, offices, as well as our break room. The Brown Trail School of Preaching is the only sound brotherhood preaching school that has a Spanish department. We have guys come in from all over the world to go through our program in the Spanish department. We've, uh, we've also done some remodeling in the past year. The library used to be upstairs. Now the library's downstairs in the, new, the old multi-purpose room. And we've been able to turn the old library into uh, the sectioned off part. There was an office library. You remember that, Sean? That's my office now. They just sealed it up and made a hole in the wall for the door uh, so I can get into my office. It's not literally a hole in the wall. It's an actual door. Um, So I don't want people to think, he's got to crawl into work? That's awful. So we, uh, we ended up splitting the library up into two parts. One is a classroom as, in, as well as the Brown Trail Network. So we've got our Spanish guys on the Brown Trail Network right now. If we start recording English sermons, I'll let you know. Make sure my sermons are on late at night. So if you're just having trouble getting to sleep, you can just turn my voice on and just slowly drift away. So we'll make sure that we stay on top of those. Can you announce that when it, when it happens? Fantastic. Great. 
But uh, the, the beautiful thing about our Spanish department is that they've grown so much that they've already outgrown their classroom that was made. So we're going to have to figure out what to do. Our Spanish department has three instructors, uh, Willie Alvarenga, Jesus Martinez, and Obed Rodriguez, all three graduates of our program. Jesus Martinez is actually the graduate of the, uh, or is actually the preacher for the Brown Chill Iglesia de Cristo. And they started off in our chapel, and they grew too large for the chapel. Then they ended up in a, cl- a big classroom downstairs. They've grown too large for the big classroom downstairs. Now they're in the old multi-purpose room, and guess what's probably going to happen? They're gonna, when I say grow too large, not grow too large like me. I mean grow numerically. They're going out and evangelizing effectively. Now, I, I didn't start off in a very good way because my wife started off as a great cook. And, and sometimes you lose a little bit of weight and then you gain it. She started right off the bat as a good cook. Have you heard of that Pinterest website? You put all the food on there. And she's coming home I'm, and she's making like three musketeers bars and putting them in the refrigerator. I've lost a little bit of weight now, but it wasn't good there for a while. But I, I preached in Oklahoma for a little while. And I would go and uh, mow one of the widow's yards. So her husband had been a preacher who had passed away. That's why she's a widow. And uh, we'd sit on the swing in her driveway. And and we were talking one day, and she said, J.J., let me tell you, when the first six months I was married, I treated my husband like a god. I was like, what? That didn't sound like a very sound thing to say. This is a very knowledgeable woman. I said, sister, what do you mean? She said, well, at least once a week I'd bring before him a burnt offering. (laughs) Yes. But our Spanish department is thriving and doing well. Our English department, we have uh, the most hours of combined preaching experience of any, uh, any school in the Brotherhood. We've got, uh, who all of you had? You had anybody that's teaching at the school come out here? we got Randall Morris, Robert Dodson. Morris. You had Randall Morris, uh, Ken Hope. Uh, yeah. <laughs> no, we haven't had any. Then I list them off. Yeah, we've had all those guys. <laughs> Yeah, Bill Burke does a fantastic job at the school. We've got, uh, we had Perry Cotham, and that made us about 450 years of experience because he's preached for 80. So, uh, but uh, Brother Cotham, I was in his last class. Mentally, he's still sharp as can be, but physically, his body's shutting down. But um, he, he was a trooper the whole way through. But uh, you'll get a fantastic education with our school and with the, the diligent studies these men have done in presenting the truth. Uh, the beautiful thing about the school, and, and Sean can attest to this, is well, I don't care about anybody's opinion. Opinions aren't going to help me at all. I want the word, and, and that's what we get at Brown Trail, is you get the word. You learn to study hermeneutics, the science of interpretation. You have three homiletics courses. You get Greek. That's a lot of fun. Kenny Gardner over at Plano East is our Greek teacher. And he's, uh, does anybody know Kenny? Well, you know Kenny. He's a little bit on the laid back side. He's one of the elders over there, kind of talks a little bit like this. Matt's met him before. Doesn't he talk like that just a tad? I love old Kenny. Let me tell you what Kenny does. He comes, guys, if any of you say it's all Greek to me, I'm going to flunk you for the class. No, and uh, he goes, all right, does anybody know anything in Greek? I raised my hand. He goes, JJ, yes. I was like, I know a little Greek. He goes, you do? I said, yeah, he lives down the street from me. He uh, said that that joke was now on the list of you'll flunk. So uh, don't get many past old Kenny. But it's uh, the thing that our school provides, while it may not have the most beautiful facility, they're nice facilities. You'll be comfortable as you go into school, but you'll get the best education that you can get in the Brotherhood. Uh, I've met some instructors from Freed Hardeman at future preacher training camps and such, and they say that whenever a guy says he wants to be a preacher, he just says, go to a preaching school then. Why drop... $60,000 and not be able to pay your students loan, student loans back. And uh, you're going to get a lot more in intense Bible studies throughout the week from 8 to 3.30 every day than 50 minutes a day three times a week. Just it's common sense there. But we consider what's going on with the school and the fantastic nature that's involved. Our guys have practical applications. And there are going to be certain times you're not going to see Matthew very often. Because he's going to be going out and filling in to, to preach. There's, that's a way that Matthew's going to get better. Now, he's not going to get better sitting there being eye candy, doing a great job. But he's going to need to go out and be able to apply the things that he's studied. So you may not see him as much, and that's an awesome opportunity that we have, as, uh, that the students have. I'm not a student anymore. 
but the, uh, the congregations call in, hey, I'm going on vacation, hey, I'm going off to this lectureship, hey, I'm going off to do this, I'm excited for the phone calls about PTP, because guys wait to the last minute, and then we have 50 calls, hey, I'm going to be at Polishing the Pulpit, can somebody fill in? Yeah, this weekend was all the students have been gone for weeks now on that, so congregations call in, hey, we need somebody to fill in this Sunday, and our students go out and they get opportunity. It's a benefit to the congregation as they have a sound gospel preacher, and it's a benefit to the student because they're able to go out and to get experience in, in teaching what they've learned. They, they also have practical applications in door knocking campaigns. I'm kind of excited about the door knocking campaign. So actually wearing my door knocking shoes, I think I knocked 6,000 doors in these while I was in school. And it's a lot of fun. I enjoyed door knocking. And it's one of those, the way that the door knocking campaigns work is a congregation like here at Roy City says, you know what, we'd like to hold a gospel meeting and we'd like to get the guys to come over from Brown Trail. We've got material that we want to hand out. We'll work together with the Brown Trail guys, knock every door in town, hold a meeting, set up Bible studies uh, and, and do things of that nature. And it's, it's really an exciting point for the students as well as for the congregation. It's, uh, it's invigorating. And if that's something that would interest you all here, I know the guys would love to do it, as Sean has a good reputation with the school, and school loves Sean, and Sean loves us, so uh, I guess I didn't need to do that, but, I, hmm, so we consider that, uh, I mean, that if that's something you think would be good, I know the guys would love to be able to come out here, do, in here and do that. The, uh, the other practical applications the guys have is they're able to go to three different lectureships a year. Uh, they're able to go to the Fort Worth lectures in January. They're able to go to the uh, Spiritual Sword lectures in October and every year. But this year, they're able to go to the alumni lectures at Brown Trail. This year, they're going to Andover, Kansas, and weren't able to come to the alumni lectures, which were fantastic. Sean and Matthew were there, and just we had a, it was a, definitely a spiritual feast. The guy that put it together this year did an awesome job. And after it's over, I'll tell you who put it together. But uh, it, was, uh, it was really well done, and we got a, a real spiritual feast. We sold books and, of, and everything. It was, it was really good, but the guys have the opportunity to go out and spend a few days, spending all day hearing the Word of God from a, from a certain theme. Uh, there are many different things that people can do to help the school of preaching. Uh, it doesn't just have to be via check. We definitely covet your prayers as uh, Matthew is making a big life-changing decision to come and to be a gospel preacher. And uh, one of the things is that, uh, that we mentioned is this is a full-time job. He's going to be getting a check to come into school to be able to support his family. And if a congregation that supports him like, uh, waits until the third week of the month, we're not going to hold that against Matthew. His focus is the Word of God. He's going to get his check beginning of the month, every month for two years. So he's going to be able to solely focus on studying the Word of God. That sounds like a pretty good deal, doesn't it? Study the most important thing there is in the world to do. It's hot out there. It's really hot out there. If I had the choice of working as a carpenter or studying the Word of God with a glass of lemonade what would you rather do I think it's a pretty easy decision but we're in a shortage of sound gospel preachers we need men like Matthew and we need men that are ready to step up and some people say well I'm just not talented enough I'm not talented enough if we all hold ourselves to an unrealistic standard I would have never started preaching I'd still be coaching football somewhere but the thing is, is we all have unique personalities. And those of us who, ha I mean, we have a unique uh, personality. If we love God, we can go out and go and reach someone that may not be reached. Uh, I joke around that I'm an unapologetic arm twister. Is if I twist your arm, you come to preaching school, you go out and preach, or you're a youth minister, you work with a congregation, and you go baptize 100 people, I'm not sorry. I'm not a bit sorry that you came to school. And uh, some guys, I mean, come in, they don't want to work full-time preaching. That's okay, too. Come in, go out and get a job and work with a congregation. Small congregations deserve sound preachers, too. Amen? And I mean, y'all got Sean. It's close enough. <laughs> I'm just playing. But some guys say, well, I don't want to, I don't want to be a full-time preacher. I don't want to be a preacher. I want to be a youth minister. And I, I was pretty good at being a youth minister. But our, our school is open for people that want to be missionaries, youth ministers, associate ministers, pulpit ministers, or men that want to go back into the secular world and work with congregations. And 
we have to consider what's going on in the world today. Our, is, the, is our society in moral decay? Oh, yeah. Never thought I would turn on the television and see that the, the President of the United States supports homosexual marriage. We're going to be in for some hurting here in the next few years. If you stand up for the truth and say homosexuality is a sin, if you say that it's wrong to be married, divorced, and remarried for anything other than fornication, people get mad and upset. But what we see with the liberal media today is fascism at its root. Is we're going to label you a bigot if you don't agree with the perversions that we want to push. And, if, and we saw with the mayors of Chicago and Boston, we don't want Chick-fil-A in our town. We don't like their type of business. Really? I, I didn't realize the American dream was predicated on somebody else's beliefs. So we, we, we look at what's going on. It's fascism and it's true. You disagree with us, we're going to shut you out. We as Christians need our strong men and our strong ladies to stand up in our communities ready to go out and teach the truth. Because this world is going to get worse for us. 2 Timothy 3.12 guarantees persecution. We're going to be persecuted, but heaven's going to be worth it. At the end of the book, Have Atheists Proved There Is No God? Thomas B. Warren states clearly that when we die, we're going to realize things could have been a million times worse and heaven would have been worth every minute of it. And those that didn't put forth the effort that they could have are going to be in hell and realize, I should have put forth that effort, and it could have been a million times worse, and I still should have done what was right. We need men to step up. We've got men that are talented in many different areas. And what's so difficult about my job is I'll go and I'll talk to someone. Come and be a preacher. And grandmama will tell them don't do it. Their parents will tell them don't do it. Friends will tell them don't do it. And a lot of the time it's because of this. My wife and I took a $130,000 a year pay cut to do what I'm doing now. And I'm happier than a pig in slop. I love what I'm doing. I love sharing the gospel. I love finding people to go and be gospel preachers. I love raising funds for these guys that come in to want to go to school. There's a saying we have in school. Matthew's going to hear it a lot, so good you'll go ahead and hear it now. Is the good news about being a preacher is you deal with the brethren. And the bad news about being a preacher is you deal with the brethren. There's goods and good and bad in all lines of work, but what I saw personally, it was more rewarding for me to study with someone and then obey the gospel, having their sins washed away, or as Jim Dubchuk yesterday having said, having, having their skin washed away with the blood of Christ. I don't know if he caught that or not, but it was funny. But I got much more joy out of studying with someone and then obeying the gospel than calling touchdown plays. But that's just me. When we've got people that are so talented they could do anything they want, why not focus on the most important thing there is in the entire world? All things are in place right now at Brown Trail. We have the facilities. We have the faculty. We have an eldership that's supporting. We've got a proven track record. And we've got an opportunity. If you're even considering coming to school, talk to me. It can happen. It can happen. And it'll be a decision you won't regret. One of the first scriptures that we hear is 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 2. But as we're turning to 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 2, I'd like to let you know the different types of ways that you can support a student. Some people say, well, since I can't support monthly, that I'm just not going to be able to help at all. That's not a good attitude to have. There are many different ways that people can help students. We have guys send suits up to the school. We have people send one-time donations. The vast majority of my support has been one-time donations. We got a sweet little old lady down in Blooming Grove, Texas. I shouldn't say little old lady. A seasoned Christian woman who sends $25 a month every month. You think that $25 a month matters? You bet it does. There are all kinds of different things. Add the school to your will in all these different areas. How much time do I have left, Sean? As much as I want. Well, I mean, <laughs> well, what, how much time do I have left? 10 15? Hey, that's, oh, there's a clock up there. It's not digital. I can't read it. It's teasing. 
2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 2, Paul is writing to Timothy, the young evangelist. As Christians, one thing that we should strive to, to, to be and to have, we should desire to have an older brother in the faith like a Paul or an older sister that can help us. We should desire to be a Barnabas to someone and encourage. And we should desire to find someone like a Timothy to pour the knowledge that we've studied into. And as Paul is charging young Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 2, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. That, that preach the word comes from the Greek karutsan ton lagan. Karutsan comes from the Greek word karuso, which is to preach or to proclaim. Now, is everyone able to come up here and preach? No. We have gender rules in the church, not because God's a mean guy, but that's what God had planned. We all as Christians have a responsibility to proclaim the gospel, amen? We, I consider Matthew chapter 28, let's turn over there. Matthew chapter 28, we see the Great Commission. I know some of this I mentioned in the uh, sermon I had over at Cottonwood a couple weeks back, but you get to hear it all over again. Matthew chapter 28, starting in verse 19. We see, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. I am with you always to the end of the age. One of the things I loved about studying the Old Testament was the fact that God is a God who keeps His promises and will do whatever it takes to make sure that His promises are kept. I love that. If God said it was going to happen, what happened? What God said. It was easy. You could put that in the bank. If God said He was going to do it, it was going to happen. For Jesus to say, I will be with you always to the end of the age, is there's an implication that... Whenever I say peas, all over the microphone, my apologies. But whenever there's an, when, when Christ made this implication of I'll be with you, that doesn't mean that He's going to tug us by the sleeve to the lost. That's not how Christ or the Holy Spirit works. He means there is success in the spreading of the gospel. And there is much success in spreading of the gospel. We look back to Numbers chapter 13 and we see the 12 spies are, are being charged to go into this land that God had promised them. Keynote, key, key promised them. This land that flowed with milk and honey. And the twelve spies go in and they come back out. And in Numbers chapter 13, verses 33 and following, the ten spies give a bad report. They go, oh no, they're giants. They've got fortified cities. We look like grasshoppers in their side. And there's a decent chance that they might think we actually are grasshoppers. But in Numbers chapter 13, verse 30, Caleb says, Let us go and take this land. He knew that if God had promised them this, that it was going to happen. Have you ever wanted to have an evangelistic campaign? And you say, Let's go out and let's knock doors. Hey, let's go out and let's do this. And there was somebody that's like, It's just no use. Nobody wants to hear the truth anymore. Got them denominations, giant buildings. Youth groups that are six flags over Jesus? I said that last time. She gave the same response. They're just too much fun. Nobody wants the truth anymore. There's just no hope and there's just no use. Has anybody heard of people that have had that attitude? Absolutely. Who does that remind you of? Those ten spies? What happened to those ten spies? Numbers chapter 14 said they died by plague as an example. Now, are we going to physically see people die by plague for not obeying God? Well, in some cases, the AIDS epidemic might be one side of that. Hadn't really thought of that before just now. I'll add that in from now on. But we consider that people aren't going to just drop dead because they haven't done what's right. But there is a plague that is plaguing them. Sickness that is plaguing them. And that's sin. We as Christians need to be a people that say, we may not have 500 members, we, not, we may not have a Starbucks coffee house in our foyer, but we have the truth of the New Testament, and it's up to us to share the gospel. You know, there's a reason the Jehovah's Witnesses and the Mormons are growing at the rate that they're growing. 
And it's sure not their doctrine. Huh. What? Somebody come up to my house and tell me I'm going to get my own planet. Really? 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 I'm not going to get a planet. That's crazy. Show me the scripture for that. Now, now, I love it when people knock on my door. That's easy. They're going to come and talk to me. So I, I was about to take my, was my, she wasn't my wife yet, but I was going to take her to a Mavericks basketball game. And all of a sudden, two elders who are just out of Pampers come up the driveway and knock on my door. And I'm like, y'all want to study the Bible? And they're like, yeah. I was like, come on in. <laughs> if, you're not, if you're going to come to me, I'll make this easy. So I'm like, all right, here's what we're going to do. You believe the Bible is the inspired Word of God, 1 2 Timothy chapter 3, 16 and 17. Oh, yeah. Yeah, we do. I said, all right, I'll let you talk until you defy or you contradict what the Bible says. And they're like, all right, we can do this. I'm like, all right, Scooter, get going. And they're like, okay, Moroni was a very good man. And he died and he came back as an angel. Er! I'm like, you're going to have to stop. I said, when we die, we don't come back as angels. I mean, I know it's persnickety, and I don't really say this out loud all that much, but when a, a baby dies, or when somebody passes away and someone goes, I just guess heaven needed another angel. Heaven didn't get another angel. They got a precious soul in paradise. So when we hear, when we, I told them the angelic host was created separate and apart from mankind. Angels have no scheme of redemption. And that's obvious in how angels react with humans. Because an, you ever notice how an angel comes to talk to someone and like, and they're like, I have this message to give to you. And the person's like, let me worship you. Do not worship me. You are going to get me in trouble. I don't want that to happen. Angels don't have a scheme of redemption. God provided us with a scheme of redemption. We have an opportunity to have our sins washed away. That's like baptizing puppies and kitties. That we're separate and apart from angels. Isn't that right, Sean? You're not doing the puppy thing anymore, are you? Not anymore. Okay. Glad I was able to study with you out of that. From then on, uh, we had the Bible study and they didn't like the result. And I don't know if you know this or not, and I'm not picking on anybody. But one of the things that the Mormons do is if they realize that you're a lost cause and they wipe the dust from their feet, they have silver paint that they dot your curb with. So the next time Mormons come by, and it's not gaudy and obvious, it's just a little dot. Next time Mormons go by, they're like, eh, I'm not going to mess with that one and just keep going. Well, one of the guys said, I've got to go outside for a minute. We're like, all right, well. So we, we, I kept studying. Well, he comes back in, and he's red-faced mad. And I'm like, well, it's my turn. Let's go over the qualifications of elder. In 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1, you guys married? No. You guys new converts? Yeah. You this, you that? No. How are you call, qualified to be elders? I want to go, you just expect me to change something that millions of people are doing? I was like, yes. If it's wrong, you don't do it. This is easy. But I went outside, and not only had they dotted my curb, but apparently he spilled some of the paint. I'd never been so close to going, sweetheart, we need to buy some paint for the curb. I want this to happen again. I'm hoping that I was able to share the gospel. And I was loving with him. I tell some of this to make you laugh, but this is what happened. I hope that they're able to see that what we're teaching is wrong. There's a reason that they're growing at the rate they're growing, and it's not because of common sense. It's because they're actually going out and doing it. They're actually going out and teaching. What if it were us instead? What if it were us that was going out and reaching these people that are searching for the truth and we show them the truth? Not something you have to settle for. Not some man-made creed book or catechism or what some popey in a funny hat says or anything along those lines. We have the Bible and the New Testament pattern to follow. We know how to become Christians. We know how to worship God in a pleasing way. We know how to live the Christian life. We can effectively go out and share the gospel with a world that so desperately needs it. I know some of this has been fun tonight, but... In school, we say preaching is as serious as a heart attack. We can have some fun. 
But the fact is, is there are people that are lost and dying in the world of a sin problem. Let it be us that goes out. Let it be us that's the good example. Let it be us that shares with them the gospel. And if you're not comfortable sitting down with somebody and having a Bible study, invite them to services. I'm sure that Sean would love to... If you're like, you know, I just don't feel comfortable. How do I do a Bible study? Sean, would you want to spend time with somebody teach them? You sure? You heard it from the horse's mouth or the horse's nod, I guess. She didn't say anything. Sean would love to work with you. I'm not a hard guy to find. Matthew, am I a hard guy to find? Give me a call. We've got to teach the Word. We have to preach the Word. So this evening as we close our thoughts... The Brown Trail School of Preaching has, has a fantastic reputation for a reason. We train men to be gospel preachers. We train men with two years of Bible study that they can go out and effectively share the gospel with others as well as to stir other Christians up to good works. You don't have to be a preacher. Some can't be preachers. But we all have a responsibility to share the gospel. What would it take for you to reach your full potential? What would it take for you to reach that potential? Would it be quitting a job that you may like to come and spend two years studying the most important thing there is and leading hundreds, if not thousands of people to Christ? The money's there. There are people that want to train gospel preachers. If, you have a, if you're not a Christian this evening, there's no amount of good works that you can do. I see people shutting me out already. All right, time for the invitation. Let's grab the song books and hope he shuts up. <laughs> well, let's th- consider what it takes to become a Christian. It's important. No amount of good works can wash away one single sin. The only thing that washes away our sin is the blood of Christ. How do we come in contact with that blood? If you've heard that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and, and that He's the Savior and that, that we needed to have our sins washed away, you're ready and you, and you believe that. You're ready to repent of your sins, the, the about face of living a sinful life to a life for God. If that, that life of Galatians 2.20, I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live not I, but Christ lives in me. When I repent, I die to my old self and live as if I were Christ in person, doing the best I can to further the kingdom. Ready to confess that Jesus Christ is the Lord and the Savior that you need. And ready to be immersed into the watery grave of baptism, not to wash the slime off your body, not to take a bath and and to to clean up a little bit, but to be saved, as 1 Peter 3.21 says. As Romans chapter 6, verses 3 and 4 state, to walk in a newness of life. Then you're part of God's army. You get to be a soldier for the most important battle that there is, and it's us against the devil. But if you're already a Christian and you hadn't been the soldier you needed to be, you can change that. You don't have to come forward to change that, but your change will be obvious to those around you. But if you need the prayers of the congregation to get right, to, to, to motivate you to doing what you can do. There's no shame in asking for prayers. Sean, is there shame in asking for prayers? You ever asked for prayers before? Yes. You know what? I have too. And I'm a cool dude. No shame in it at all. If you have any spiritual needs, please come forward as we stand and sing.